I've talked about this in the AI Act. The idea there also is to make the European Union a, a, a big power in AI, right? And so by simply having this goal, it's already concretized that AI is this transformative force, right? We need to use it. We need to kind of move into the future with AI, right? And so here again, then we see the myth, namely AI being a technological savior, a solution to something. We do not really know what. How can AI be helpful for affordable housing? I'm not sure it can. I'm, I'm not sure if we need AI, right, in this regard. And so these questions are then pushed to the side, all as a result of this initial myth. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Paul Schutz. Paul is a research assistant in the Ethics and Critical Theories of Artificial Intelligence Research Group at the University of Osnabrück. He researches and teaches on the societal impact and ethical challenges of digital technologies, as well as in the social philosophy of the climate crisis. Paul joined me today to talk about AI futurism, an unfiltered look at AI's true effects on the climate crisis. I reached out to Paul on Blue Sky after reading his paper, which details the societal myths that make artificial intelligence a reality, which then feed back into society as devastating real-world impacts. The broad strokes of these myths could be Western progress, technological development, and the belief that something surely will save the system and save us from ourselves. This inevitability of a technological solution to a planetary crisis has been made a material reality by policymakers around the world who are desperate for their territories to become leaders in artificial intelligence, throwing billions at the problem, organizing conferences, passing legislation, coaxing private companies over their borders, all whilst ignoring the very real material problems of the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, water crisis, pollution crisis, political crisis, economic crisis, housing crisis, genocide crisis, food crisis, military crisis, authoritarian crisis, and the list goes on and on. Paul and I discuss all this and more in this episode, from the myth of scale to the European Artificial Intelligence Act, from the religiosity driving the myths that make AI to the crisis of finite resources, ending with a fascinating discussion on dematerialization, submission, and domination. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Paul, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me and inviting me. Ah, I was very happy to. Uh, as I said before we started, it's not very often that I reach out to somebody, but... When I had a look at your paper, I thought, yeah, that seems right up the Planet Critical alleyway. So yeah, thanks for making time and getting back to me so swiftly. That's great to hear, definitely. My first question for you is, why is the world in crisis? Well, yeah, that's a very broad and very difficult question. And I'm sure you have had many different answers on the show already, right? So many different dimensions have been covered. And I think the key here is also to acknowledge that there are so many dimensions and that, for instance, I myself can only ever speak of my own angle or my own kind of point of view and what I'm interested in. And so from my perspective, one of the key reasons why the planet is in crisis is because we kind of seem to be stuck in these power relations and kind of 
societal regimes, which keep us captive, never, or, or even though we, we know that the planet is in crisis, right? So it's not kind of a secret or it has been discussed for many years, actually, and still nothing is happening and business as usual is continuing. And so there seems to be these power relations, these regimes that, yeah, keep people from, from changing things and keep things from happening. And so when I'm saying this, I'm always talking from my perspective in the global north, right? And so um, my perspective is always geared towards understanding societies and power relations in countries of the global north, specifically in, in Germany, also where I'm situated. But yeah, I think that that's my angle on, on understanding why the planet is in crisis. I think it's a fundamental part of why the world is in crisis, these regimes and power relations. And I often find on like the conference circuit, um, they are the pieces of the puzzle that are often not discussed because it's very difficult to discuss them within about 20 seconds of discussing them. You come up against that wall of realizing there's not very much that we can do about it, um, certainly at a small scale. Um, and so I think that's kind of why they are pushed to the side beyond a existing in quite an abstract way. Once you become aware of the material manacles that are placed on oneself as a citizen, um, I think it is often better to then choose to bury oneself in, in what feels possible um, rather than what feels insurmountable. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that's very well put. Um, talking about these probably bigger picture things or, or large scale structures always, yeah, feels, if, if, if doesn't feel good, let's say this. So it feels like, okay, well, what can we do now? And for instance, I, I also come across this as in my teaching at the university where I give seminars and we talk about these systemic problems or structures and how, how they might be part of the problem. And then quickly the question is always, okay, but what can we do about it? And then suddenly you're faced with this very difficult question, how to surmount these large scale structures or what can we actually change within them? Um, and these questions are actually very difficult. And then they kind of also divert from really diving deep into these um, larger structures and power relations, yeah. But I think part of the trap, and this is, I think, also kind of what you refer to in, in your essay, which is how I found you, is the scale problem. We live in a world of such scale um, where technology makes things at scale be possible, essentially, that yield citizens are sort of faced with this um, belief, I think, this myth that change has to be big and change will only succeed if it is big. And remembering the power of like decentralized networks, decentralized organizations, um, autonomy on a local scale is very, very difficult because it's a, it's a countercultural force essentially when the vast majority of our culture is focused on selling essentially the biggest possible version of an idea which of course uses up the most amount of resources that an idea could um, suggest as well. Yeah for sure I think that's a great observation because from my perspective and I'm, I'm working on AI and how you know, the whole machinery around AI how it's material manifestations and ideological manifestations how they are connected to the climate crisis. And so this fits perfectly right to the scale thing, because as you said, we are kind of sold this idea of that change or solutions need to be big. So we always seek to seek for these solutions. I don't know, to fix, um, CO2 emissions, right? So we want to become, um, carbon neutral or something. And then we look towards AI, for instance, to, I don't know, better infrastructure, um, change the um, electricity grid and all that. And so these are, I would say, very much large scale solutions. And as you rightly pointed out, we tend to forget then what can be done on a small scale, right? So I don't know what your local level of organization can do. Um, and I think that's very important to keep in mind also to keep 
sane, so to say, right? So not to get um, sucked in and lose hope um, upon the scale. Yeah. Uh, definitely, because if you get sucked in by the scale, I think that you will make very little difference uh, because even the people that are promulgating this kind of vision, the people at what we consider to be the very top of sort of the social, political power hierarchy, every time I watch their announcements or look at their development, I feel that they are not in control either. They're victims um, <laughs> of a system that they perpetuate, but have very little power actually within this hugely complex thing that was built a very, very long time ago and is now sort of running itself. Um, so I think there's also a kind of, um, there is an inherent impossibility of solutions, quote unquote, at scale. Um, because they buy into the very problem that is perpetuating the crisis in the first place. Exactly. And I think what you just said is, fits perfectly all the, all this, the system, right? So this large scale system, I think it's a multitude of systems, right? So you, you mentioned that it was built a long time ago. And so I think there's this great book from Andreas Malm. I'm, I'm sure you, you might know him called Fossil Capital, right? And so this might be one of the go-to points where you would say, well, okay, look, this, the problem or the system has been built a long time ago. And then there he develops how fossil capital, fossil capitalism, um, kind of is the root cause of what we might now call the planetary crises. Um, however, I also think that there are many other different interlocking systems at work, right? So. Um, for instance, I'm interested in now AI, as I, as I mentioned already, and how AI capitalism and maybe newer form or just a version of this fossil capitalism, right? How this influences our perception of the climate crisis. And I think equal to this, then there's many different and still intersecting systems that all have these imperatives that, that, that we need to negotiate, yeah. Definitely. And I think we should now get into the, the topic of your, well, what, you, what it is that you're researching. Um, and so, I mean, AI is everywhere, right, at the moment. It's all over the news. It's all over people's ideas of how we're going to make everything better. It's um, this, you know, vast private, com uh, vast private competition that is being also sort of uh, weaponized and nigh on funded. Um, by public money with regards to, you know, conferences that are being held and the bids to attract um, investments and in companies into within uh, national borders. So it seems to be a thing that is running away with itself. Uh, you've got experts calling out saying, we have to slow down, we have to regulate, we don't know what it is, it's a huge existential threat. Um, but much like the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis and the water crisis and the everything crisis is an existential threat, it doesn't seem to be slowing the thing down. So you were looking at the role of myth making and culture with regards to how AI has come into being in the way that it has and why it is that we seem unable to or unwilling to, to get off it. So could you begin by speaking to that, perhaps the, the myths before we go into what those myths are, namely, you know, neoliberal, uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, first we also need to acknowledge that AI is this huge machinery, which also has this material side, right? And I think in that sense, on this material level, it's also interlinked with what you mentioned, the water crisis, resource consumption, extraction, etc. So I think this is a very crucial part. However, what I am then also focusing on is kind of this ideological dimension, right? So how is AI maybe part of a larger socio-cultural regime which keeps us from addressing the climate crisis appropriately? And so they are then come in the myths, right, as you mentioned them. And part of the myth of these myths are simply that we believe that this technology can be a solution, right? So for instance, we could decide to do things totally differently, um, to look at systemic changes. There are people, and I'm sure you've spoken to them already, who have ideas about degrowth and how to do more large-scale changes, right? 
But then AI comes in and seems to be this promise of how we can continue to do the same things we've always done, just in a more optimized and efficient way. And it kind of sells us this idea of, okay, you can keep going, but now it's just sustainable or at least better than before. And then we kind of run after this constant optimization and it's always this next step of doing something better, more optimized. And this keeps us also from kind of asking these larger questions. Okay, maybe we need more systemic changes, changes on a societal level rather than these solutions and optimizations in different um, areas. I do find it utterly fascinating that it is easier to increase the amount of rare earths that we're extracting um, use up a huge amount of fresh water in the manufacturing and cooling process um, and even you know code something that is as remarkable as artificial intelligence which isn't intelligent exactly but it is, it is a remarkable machine essentially that humanity has produced it is more feasible to do all of those things than to have a political conversation about degrowth in the mainstream or about um, donut economics in the mainstream or talk about free housing or talk about raising the tax bans to, you know, maybe at least 50%, even though they were at, you know, 80, 90% in the 60s and 70s. It is more feasible to do all of those things that are so resource heavy um, and exploitative than even have a conversation about systemic reform, let alone uh, do systemic reform. Yeah, I think that's exactly exactly right. And I find also fascinating that in the public, we kind of seem to be stuck with, with these more, let's say, flashy solutions, right? What you said, well, okay, how can we develop this next big AI system seems to be more flashy than talking about, oh, well, how can everybody have, um, have housing, right? So, um, and I find it very fascinating that the public or also policymakers seem to be stuck with this. And I think this is exactly where we see the power of these societal regimes at work, right? Because it's very startling that, as you said, this one thing is much more possible than, than the other thing, which is very much simple, right? We can just have a conversation and talk about, well, how should we do this? And I think everybody would agree that it would be nice for people to have housing, that good public infrastructure would be nice, that a uh, sustainable economy would be nice, right? I think everybody can agree on this. Nonetheless, we don't talk about this. And so I think this exactly shows the power and also the, the, the dynamics at work, um, how powerful they are in keeping us from discussing these things. I think it also reveals a shift, and I'm totally riffing here, I've got no data, but a potential shift as well in which industries um, are more centered in the axis of control because energy absolutely runs the world in many respects. But it's not the energy companies anymore that are making the biggest profits. It is these, you know, the companies that are coming out of social, uh, out of social media, out of Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> the companies that are coming out of Silicon Valley that exist in such an inflated uh, and dematerialized economic world that before they have even built a product, many companies can be valued at $1 billion, these unicorn companies, which is totally absurd. And I think recently as well, you know, the links that we are seeing between um, AI, Meta, Israel's campaign in Palestine, uh, possibly this data from WhatsApp being used to target people by their AI targeting killing <laughs> algorithm, essentially. Um, I think it shows that these masters of, or those who control the, the what Yanis Varoufakis says, those that control the means of communication now are in control rather than controlling the means of production. Um, and so it's, I think, unsurprising as well that this myth of AI is completely run away with itself because, I mean, those companies now have so much power with which to construct myths, not only in the populace that uses their tools, but because of the amount of profit that they are generating from that, being able to walk into policymakers' uh, offices or presidents' offices 
um, and make certain demands or offer certain things like data. It's terrifying, actually. Yeah, right. So you wouldn't even know what what's going on there in regards to policy, right? So for instance, in, in the U EU, the AI Act has just been um, been passed. And so it's kind of this regulation on, on AI and it also classifies different AI systems into different levels of risks, right? And so there's been huge um, criticism on how these how these AI systems are classified um, and that many systems would fall out of, for instance, high risk AI, which would then be heavier regulated or sometimes even forbidden and how this has all been kind of, yeah, classified and how, uh, how all of this has been developed. And so there's, especially I think from the law community, um, been many crit critis um, many people who criticize this, um, and so that's what exactly what you said, right? Also, of course, these companies influence how these policies are done and um, what's written in there, and that probably um, their interests are kept in mind. Yeah. Oh, without a yeah, shadow of a doubt. Sure. I mean, when we think about data as well being the the new gold of this century, um, and the collusion that we have seen, uh, you know, I'm using the word alleged, but, but the collusion that we've already seen between some of these massive companies and the police, for example, or the state more generally. Um, yeah, that's, I think it's very obvious that there's a fairly symbiotic relationship now. Exactly. That's pretty shocking as well, because um, in Germany, I don't think we have many public debates on this, but um, there's this company from Peter Thier um, called Palantir, and mm -hmm. they have these... I don't actually know exactly what what they're doing, but they um, kind of develop algorithms and um, data analysis tools in regards to criminal justice. And I think many German police, um, so the federal police and the um, the local police stations, I think they're um, kind of working with the software. And I think that's very concerning. But I don't think we have a very big public debate on this, and we, we're not questioning whether this this all right or not. And I think that's um, a huge issue as well. Yeah, Palantir has been all over the news um, in recent years. I can't quite remember what for, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I think it has been for these criminal justice systems. I don't know. Probably there was um, also something else. But in Germany, it's um, been in some news. The police is using it, but I, I think they're kind of flying under the radar with this and they're just adopting these systems without actually huge questions in um, public, in the public or um, in politics as well. Apparently, uh, I've just had a quick look. Palantir was a startup um, that was used to target and kill Osama bin Laden. Oh, wow. So there you go. And now, and now it's not a startup anymore. It's an absolute data mining exactly. algorithmic machine. There was a really lovely bit in your paper that I'd like to read out, if I may. Yes. This is the central theme of socio-technical imaginary of AI. Its technologies carry the unspoken hope that when the artificial machine arrives in this future slash present, which is always inevitably imminent, it will manifest as a superior intelligence which will outsmart humans and mend all of our problems. Within the imaginary of AI lies a reverence for the power of technology at large, the magic tool to rescue the global capitalist system from its dramatic failures. What I love so much about that point, especially in relation to what we've just been discussing, is it seems that the very sort of cutting edge of AI at the moment is destruction, annihilation, killing, military, essentially, as if the dramatic failures of the global capitalist system either haven't been learned um, or that there is a pervasive kind of subconscious belief, you might say, that the only way to save the global capitalist system from its failures is to reduce the amount of people that are using the system or dependent on the system in order to ensure and maintain high resource extractive lifestyles. Mm -hmm. 
that's an interesting take. So I think in, the, in this passage, I'm building on, on the work of Benedetta Previni. And I think she, she describes the myth of, which is just inherent to AI, basically, that, that it's in fact this intelligence, right? And so into this intelligence, we then project the idea of this being, being more than human intelligence or being better always. And I think we talked about this in the beginning. I think the central idea there is that we hope that this better than human intelligence may then come and save our faults or something, right? And I don't think it's it's that it's put that, that that explicitly, but it's this implicit hope that we can develop a tool which then saves all of these problems, right? Um, and I think this is this the core myth of AI, and I think this is one of the central maybe beliefs that keeps AI going. Um, and for instance, you can see this in ideas of sustainable AI, right? So I've also um, had a closer look at what, what, what the ideas of behind sustainable AI are. I think the very uh, underlying assumption there is that we can build this very intelligent system, which is hopefully better than us, which can then help make the world sustainable and hopefully be somewhat sustainable itself. Um, and so I think there we can find this myth very clearly and very materially also. It's very religious, isn't it? That some superior being will save us from our own sins. Yes. Yeah, actually it is. I haven't thought about that too much about the religious side, but it seems to have a religious touch to it. Yeah. Definitely. And that's a patriarchal one as well. Yeah. Um, I think especially with this idea, and, you, and you're going to speak about this as well, the, that we must bear the costs of this progress in order to reach the final kind of like utopian destiny where this thing that we have built will, will be able to save us essentially. So no matter the cost now to the present, the future is redeemable essentially. Um, and that's very, very linked to, you know, the ideology that is prevalent in the effective altruist movement, this kind of brutal utilitarianism, alleged utilitarianism, um, that would see this world sacrificed for some eternal, expansive, dematerialized future. <clears throat> Heaven. Yeah. So I think what I find important there is that We've now been talking about these very extreme ideologies or myths, right? And so oh, what you just said, um, this, this religious take and also the effect of altruism um, part, I think it's kind of lingering in the background and maybe providing the underlying um, ideology or assumption. But I think what's also important to realize is that these are not, let's say, kind of word-to-word -word reproduced myths in, in, in the main, um, in the public sphere, right? But it's in the public, it's kind of just this, or, or in the, in, in the current mainstream, let's say, it's just this idea of, okay, well, there will be better AI solutions. Let's hope that they come to save the day. Right. And there's not this, this very extreme belief as we now formulated it, but, um, these underlying myths then kind of seep into common sense and create this public idea of uh, an imaginary of a future we want to move into without ever being explicitly spelled out, right? And I think that's very important to, to realize that these myths do not necessarily have to be found everywhere or you can't necessarily point to them everywhere, but they are this underlying basis, which then leads to a public common sense. And also a... Now, I, I understand you're using public, uh, public common sense, I, th I think, in a Gramsci way there. Um, but the beautiful irony, I find, is how it leads to an erosion of actual common sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the points that you made in your paper, which I really thought was brilliant, um, was about the fact that the imaginary of AI, these myths of AI, is this thing that will be able to save us, that will make everything more efficient, that will make everything feasible and viable and doable 
ensures that the incredible resource extraction that it demands is also tied into this myth of like, it doesn't matter that they're finite because before they run out, by using these resources to build the tool, the tool will have figured out how to extend these resources or how to be um, built in a way that doesn't need these resources. So it doesn't matter, we can keep going. The finite world is not in fact finite because we're going to figure out a code to make it infinite. Yeah, exactly. So there's this great paper by Art Halpern and she she writes about the Atacama Desert in Chile um, where they're extracting lithium um, and I think copper also. And then she goes um, to a, uni a university in Chile. I don't quite remember which one it was. Um, where they develop machine learning algorithms to improve and optimize the mining there, right? Because in the <laughs> desert, water's running out and they um, also the rare earths are running out. And at the university, they're kind of working on developing algorithms, um, extending the, the extraction there. And I think exactly this nicely shows how there's this discursive shift Right. So from talking about these very real material and finite resources and, and their ends, essentially, we now talk about, okay, how can we optimize this? How can we keep this going longer or how can we improve this where, um, where progress and improvement are just kind of the goal without ever thinking, okay, what, what for, or can we really keep this going? And I think this is this discursive shift which comes with AI where we kind of caught in this constant circle of optimization. Yeah. And that's a tech theme more broadly. I mean, a huge theme over the past, I want to say like 10 years, but maybe longer. I'm not old enough to know all of history, um, has been human optimization as well. So again, this like rather than talking about the finitude of the human experience, the finitude of the biological body, um, the beauty of being finite. There is such a push to live forever. Um, you know, people being like cryo frozen. Uh, there's one absolute nut job that's getting um, injected with his 21 year old son's plasma because wow. he thinks that keeps him young. Um, and a whole range of other sort of um, technologies, including, and this is, a bit of a stretch, but I think I can do it, including this um, huge increasing interest in the reproductive um, f capacities of women, right? Elon Musk, effective altruist, these guys are investing in research into IVF and all of these things because they're panicking about the birth rate collapsing. And I feel like that, again, is almost like a projection of the a fear of their own finiteness, of their own impermanence that gets caught up in these myths of, of, you know, going, being the person to colonize space or ensuring the survival of the human race, ensuring bringing an AI into existence. Uh, it's all a sort of, again, a search for something eternal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think these themes are especially vibrant in, in Silicon Valley, I think, or, or <laughs> where the tech bros, or let's say in the tech bro circles. Um, what you said, right? So eternal living or, or these ideas of colonizing Mars and of um, stretching everything into the future. And so I think Silicon Valley and the tech bro scene are very prominent in there. And I think there recently has been um, this paper by Tim Gebru and um, I think Emilia Torres. I don't, I don't exactly know um, the name right now. Um, and they talk about Tesquiel ideology, right? And so it got, this goes into the very same direction where they, um, under the name Tesquiel, they bundle a bunch of ideologies. I, th I think it's transhumanism, it's effective mm -hmm. altruism there as well. I don't know um, all of the ones in there. And I think they touch upon exactly what you said, right? So these underlying um, ideologies of Silicon Valley and how they are, again, in the background of perpetuating this AI hype, which then becomes publicly viable, let's say, where everybody has forgotten that in the in the back, there are these completely strange ideas where everybody would be like, okay, 
is this really this smart? I don't know. But then suddenly in the public perception, the AI hype and everything that's done there has, has gained traction. Yeah. I interviewed John Wilde on the imaginaries around AI mm -hmm. as well. And he's an artist and he came up with some absolutely fascinating stuff like linking or tracing um, the development of this ideology back to um, late 19th century Russia and an ideology called cosm cosmism, cosmoism, mm -hmm. um, in which essentially the idea was, and it was, was religious, uh, ultimately they wanted to raise the dead, bring people back from the dead um, and create a world in which there was enough space to bring people back from the dead. Because if you bring everyone back from the dead, you're going to run out of space. Mm -hmm. um, and he even found that one of the, like, the top guys in Google has like actively spoken about his desire to resurrect his father. Um, and so <laughs> like these links are very present and frightening. Um, but I think if I may, if we could talk a little bit more, I mean, this is all fascinating, right? This like big picture stuff, but if we could talk a little bit more about how these things translate into public consciousness, um, because it's all very well to be sitting here and talking about big, big myths and big narratives, and we know that they become sort of part of the zeitgeist, but how does that, how does that stuff funnel down exactly? So I think this is again, a multidimensional issue. And I think that come, there are many different processes that, 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 that interlink here. And I think one of them is this process of myth making. We've uh, talked about this before. And, um, again, here I built on Benedetta Brevini, who explains how these myths, which are, for instance, um, this, this idea of AI being a uh, savior or the, the super intelligent machine, how these myths translate or yeah, are reproduced in common sense. Right. So, um, and this is done for instance, by EU policy making or by Google um, spreading na narratives, right? So we have on the top level, one might say we have this, this myth, right? And so this is then kind of reproduced or perpetuated within these different debates, right? So for instance, in policy making, um, and I've talked about this in the AI Act, um, the idea there also is to make AI or, or make the European Union uh, a, a big power in AI, right? And so by simply having this goal, it's already um, concretized that AI is this transformative force, right? We need to use it. We need to kind of move into the future with AI, right? And so here again, then we see the myth, namely AI being a technological savior, a solution to something we do not really know what. But suddenly we see this myth very material in the in the policy, right? And um, on the policy level, then it's already manifested, right? And so the same goes for the big companies, um, the technologies they produce, the technologies they um, create are essentially results also of these myths, right? So as this example of Google Gemini, um, which is, I think, I'm not sure anymore, but I think the latest system of Google, the latest AI system, which is this multimodal chatbot, and it's supposed to do things um, with video, with images, and can produce um, all of these um, all of these things. And they kind of produced this, produced it with the intention of making technology better for everybody, with the the, the intention of making AI accessible for everybody and to make the world a better place. They say we need more technological progress. We need better, um, better technologies. We need better AI, right? And so there's this, um, promotional video and I, I really recommend read, uh, watching it, um, because there you can really watch or, or see the myth at work. Right. And so you see how these, this myths. AI being the technological savior or being a solution to some things, how it then translates into actual technologies and into the companies working, right? And um, rarely on any of these levels, the core assumption is question, namely, do we need AI at all or what do we actually need it for? But it's always, okay, the European Union needs to be a 
a power in AI now. Okay, but but why? Um, or we need this better AI system to make technology available for everybody. But why would everybody need AI, right? So for instance, as you mentioned before, how can AI be helpful for affordable housing? I'm not sure it can. I'm, I'm not sure if we need AI, right, in this regard. And so these questions are then pushed to the side and all as a result of this or, um, initial myth. Um, and so I hope this could kind of show how maybe these myths, which seem to be on the very large scale um, and might not be graspable, how they then translate into very concrete and material things. I think this is so important. Um, we are such storied creatures. And if we look at even how, you know, religion, like these kinds of stories have, have really materially created the world around us in so many respects and continue to impact us. Um, and we are so, the power of stories is amazing. We are so vulnerable to stories um, and to fall into that kind of trap of thinking that we're like fundamentally rational creatures post enlightenment and can tell a good story from an actual idea is just nonsensical. So I think this kind of work is very, very, very important. And also it's important to give um, concrete evidence to this understanding that stories impact us because it's a drum that you can bang, but if you can't give actual evidence as to it as well, then you kind of, you know, eventually you lose people. But in what you were just saying, something that came to mind in this is one thing that it is achieving this myth of AI and how it's being translated into like material policy is the dematerialization of society, this continued dematerialization this idea that it is it is a technical problem and not even just a technical problem anymore, it's a software problem. If we can find the right software, the right code, not just the right machine anymore, if we can find the right software or the right code, the problems will be fixed. And it really feeds into that this pervasive narrative that the economy is somehow um, disconnected from the biosphere, that resources are disconnected from the economy, that resources are disconnected from the biosphere, like the minute that we want them as a resource, then they don't really count as anything that's necessary in an ecosystem or part of the natural world. Um, and it really serves to perpetuate and seed that myth and keep our eyes off of the, the real material problems around us, um, which are leading us towards utter catastrophe. Exactly. And I think what is interesting here is also that this has its roots in, and you mentioned this in the beginning, basically neoliberal capitalism, or maybe you could also say in the, yeah, in the rise of neoliberal crap capitalism, right? So where the very idea of technological progress has been depoliticized and we now think of this as an end in itself, right? So Technology is not a means anymore necessarily, but it's basically an end. So, right, we want to have better technology and we want to continue this, right? And so I think this has been a core theme of, or during the rise, especially of industrial capitalism in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and alongside this then comes the dematerialization, as you mentioned, right? So the belief that we can take from the non-human nature, whatever we please. And then um, this wouldn't have an impact on the econo uh, economic system or on societies, right? So, and I think this depoliticization of technology and the dematerial thinking or the kind of disconnectedness from non-human nature, I think they go hand in hand and kind of reinforce each other and have led to exactly what, what, what you're saying, right? That we are faced with utter catastrophe and and the solutions are not ready, are not really there, or they are there and not really acted upon. Yes, I think that's it. There, but not acted upon, because they exist in a more complicated realm in which things would actually have to change, um, and we would have to grapple with the material world, uh, which works according to certain laws and principles um, that are unavoidable, and fundamental, and much bigger than us. So it's much easier to play in the sandbox where zeros and ones are all that you have to contend with. Yeah. 
and to follow this idea of, okay, we can just move on, right? So kind of move forward, whereas progress, and we kind of then move and move and move and don't look back and don't grapple with these, these fundamental principles or also maybe, yeah, rules or, or borders of what we can do, the guidelines, yeah. Totally, which feeds into another point you made in your paper, which is that this pervasive belief that is Western thought and Western democracy that is leading the charge of progress and that the world can only evolve in that direction lest it fall into some, you know, <laughs> realm of, of chaos. Um, and, and so we have to look at what Western democracy and West, the thought tradition of, of Western enlightenment actually is today. And it is this sort of, I would say this continued sense of denaturing, dematerializing, disconnecting, exploitation, extractivism, um, but also this kind of like submission to something greater in a sense, um, whether that be a Judeo-Christian God, um, whether it be an algorithm, whether it be the, the, the system itself, uh, power um, as it exists in the world as a force. And so you've got to really wonder how anybody can claim to be leading uh, when coming from a position of such willingness uh, to submit to existing forces. Mm -hmm. I think the submission point is very interesting. I hadn't thought about that too much. I, um, I have once researched on exactly this point of, okay, how is this or where does this especially Western thought come from, right? This very rationalistic and also atomistic kind of thinking about problems, about nature. And as you said, right, it started probably sometime or, or with the enlightenment and then developed, further developed, and then also interlinked with capitalism, with industrial, with the rise of industrial capitalism, right? Suddenly problems could be solved by machinery. Problems in production could be solved with better, better machines. Um, and then there's this rise of um, management styles where atomistic thinking um, came into being or, or became further perpetuated. And I think all of these dynamics then lead to this or, 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 or examples of, of this Western style of thinking. Um, and I think a great book here is Rethinking Racial Capitalism. And I've read this in um, one of my seminars, a part of it. And I think, um, it's a great way of, of yet portraying another system, right? So now we have talked about, um, and it's, let's call it AI capitalism, or I call the ideology AI, AI futurism, um, that lies behind all of this. And then in the beginning, we've talked about fossil capitalism, right? And so now then there's racial capitalism, which is yet another maybe angle of view on on the um on these problems which puts particular focus on the colonial histories and also on this um exploitation of nature and indigenous lands and peoples yeah yeah thank you very much for that i'll um put those books in the show notes for people yes please i think we are coming up to time um paul because if we go into the intersection of racial capitalism, fossil capitalism, and I think we'll be here for another hour. Yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> just going to gently put the brakes on us. Um, and thank you very much for your time. My final question for you is who would you like to platform? Um, so I mentioned her a couple of times during, um, during our talk. And so I've worked a lot with um, the research from Benedetta Brevini, and she's working on AI and the climate crisis as well. And I think she's done a lot of work on this and she's done a lot of work on the communication of a climate crisis as well. I think she might ha have to say a lot about this entire topic. And I think her work is very, um, has been very influential for me. So I think um, she might also be a good source to dive deeper into things. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for your time today, Paul. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it.
To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com, where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.